Thank you very much to all our presenters. Now we will have a, a video discussion by uh, Vanda Castello uh, from uh, the Mosmon team. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me in this session, in this uh, debate. So I, I would like to say some words on the three working paper, on the three presentation that we had here, because um, what I, 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 I saw is that those papers gathers consensus on the crucial role played by social protection programs in supporting the most vulnerable people, especially when we talk about children and elderly people. Uh, what make those programs um, key instrument uh, also in times of crisis such as the COVID-19 episode that we had um, two years ago. However, the existing problems in many countries' social protection system, especially uh, the least developed the, the least developed ones uh, like Mozambique, my home country, uh, uh, I'm talking about the low coverage of the programs, um, the high level of informality, uh, lack of well-organized database on vulnerable population, uh, and also uh, it makes it difficult to know exactly um, who are those those vulnerable vulnerable population and uh, the complexity of the eligibility criteria in many in many of the programs um, make it it makes dif difficult uh, to select uh, the, or to target um, the beneficiaries. And because of all those issues that uh, I have raised, um, the initiative uh, carried out by the government uh, have limited impact uh, during the period of shock. And the interventions uh, made in that period uh, have not been enough to reverse the reduction in consumption due to the loss of jobs and source of income of most of the, the population. And also was not uh, the intervention, the, those social uh, protection uh, programs, the initiative that the government and that, uh, has have undertaken during this period well, well, we're not uh, sufficient enough to counteract the worsening of poverty and inequalities in many countries during and after the pandemic. And also the other issue that we had before the, the, the pandemic crisis, um, we see that many of those social programs um, the amount assigned to the beneficiary were low, were considerable low. And it's common in many of the countries. Um, it's a situation that was, uh, we see that was aggravated by uh, limited fiscal space. Um, and it makes difficult to increase the amount and also uh, difficult to expand the coverage of benefits in order to meet the national targets. So these realities uh, call us to think on the need and the urgency of strengthening social protection systems um, and also take advan advantage of some initiatives that we, we saw during the COVID-19, such as the use of remote and digital solutions to reduce the cost of providing social assistance and enable the expansion of the coverage. Um, and also, it uh, means that we need to continue thinking uh, on how to make the eligibility criteria more 
flexible and also the best way of targeting uh, the beneficiaries so we can have an effective impact of this program. So despite the limited impact of social support during COVID-19, there is no doubt, as we saw in this presentation, that social protection uh, has acted as an automatic stabilizer to protect people's incomes during the pandemic, which also uh, is an opportunity that can be catapulted um, into other subsequent case of extreme shocks. So those are, are, are the words that I would like to address and thank you for this opportunity. Thanks a lot, uh, Vanda. I think she, she might be connected remotely. Uh, and perhaps as Vanda uh, rightly summarized some of the, of the key issues related to identification, targeting, but, but also, also other features of the design of policies like uh, generosity and perhaps duration. I'll just invite our presenters to keep that in mind also when we now open the room for, uh, for questions from the audience, just to come back to those main issues that Wanda also pointed out. So perhaps I'll, I'll take the opportunity as a chair to, to ask some questions and then we'll, we'll have a second round to, to open to the audience. Um, my first question to David, and something he could not uh, discuss, perhaps due to time, was validation. So for Latin American countries, now we have, uh, we have actual data for uh, the last quarter of uh, 2020. So how good does the no casting perform? And whether now with the actual data that we have for uh, 2021, uh, 2022, there has been more evidence on whether the economy has recovery and whether some of the uh, social protection programs have been actually expanded. Uh, perhaps I'll just give a, a, a set of questions and then I'll leave room for you. Uh, Catherine, uh, related to your presentation, um, I was also wondering, so as, as we see very little e effect of, uh, of social protection in times of crisis, I was wondering then what other mechanism is, is, is acting. So do you have evidence on whether, for example, in times of crisis, uh, the data shows that there's more uh, on produce, so people rely more on on produce, or whether, for example, in terms of uh, a shock in unemployment, whether uh, informal employment starts acting as, as a potential stabilizer, so people move from formal employment to informal em employment to cushion to some extent the the um, the extent of the of the shock. Whether you have any evidence on this, so, so what are people actually rely relying on? If in, in, the, in times of shock. And then finally, Gui and I was wondering, so uh, I thought it was extremely interesting to dig into the regional differences. So we saw cross-country differences in the first presentation, whereas the pictures you, you showed were, were very interesting. Uh, first, in terms of how the, the pandemic hit uh, Vietnam across regions, but then also in terms of uh, the targeting and, and, and how the, the aid packages were uh, distributed uh, uh, along the country. So I was wondering what are the, the main difference that drove, first of all, the impact of the pandemic? So do, do we also see regional differences in the healthcare system, so in, in terms of quality, in terms of, uh, of size? And then how does that open a question of, you know, uh, where, where to invest uh, in terms of healthcare or, or social protection, so whether there are big differences also uh, across those, those two dimensions? Okay, so um, for the validation part, uh, we tried several uh, strategies. Uh, at the beginning, we used a provid and also some kind of means error estimate to now cast the, the incomes, but the alternative that we uh, used for the final version of the paper was the, the, the best. Um, uh, the, the idea is make this provid and also taking the difference in average uh, earnings between groups. And uh, in terms of validation, what we found is that the distribution, uh, if you uh, estimate a kernel for um, market incomes, uh, they are quite similar. Um, we can compare this in, in Q4 because we have the complete information for Q4, so we can compare actual data for Q4 and our now casting uh, technique. And the distribution looks okay, so uh, 
the, the, the now casting seems to mimic the, the kernel distribution. But uh, if we go to Gini coefficients or poverty statistic, it's not uh, faring that well. In some countries it's uh, good, but in a couple of countries uh, it, it misses the, um, the values that we observe in, in the data. And regarding the policies in 2021, uh, for most of uh, the countries, the policies were erased. Uh, for instance, in Ecuador, we don't have policies at Q4. Maybe there is one in, at the beginning of 2021. And for, but for most countries, the emergency policies were dropped from, from the menu. So um, the idea is now with the updating of the models for the South, South Mod bundle to see the, the new policies, the, the, the effects. Um, yeah, thank you about what what coping strategies uh, households uh, apply in times of crisis. Well, because in our case we are interested in an artificial shock and how the system reacts to it. It's hard to, we are not really focusing on uh, changes in informal employment or own produce. Uh, but what we see is that if households have other household members with employment incomes or household members that are supported by uh, by the existing social protection system that uh, these income sources of other household members provide some some uh, sort of uh, insurance in times of crisis i mean they cannot cushion all the income losses but they provide some protection to to a shock to household incomes Thank you. Uh, so I think um, um, the, you raised a very important question about the, the regional difference in the social, social protection and the healthcare system in Vietnam. So in Vietnam, um, uh, as I mentioned, there are 63 provinces and uh, in Vietnam, the living standard is uh, very different across the region and across the provinces. For the social protection, actually the social protection they targeted at the household level. So uh, basically uh, there are no differences in the social protection across the province, provinces or across the region because they targeted at the household level. So they targeted at the poor and ethnic minority and the policy household. Uh, so, but in terms of the healthcare system, it's a more in the poor area, in the mountain, and the remote area, the healthcare system is not good compared with the richer region. Uh, however, in Vietnam, during the pandemic, so actually the poorer uh, area, they are less affected uh, in terms of the, of, of the COVID, because the, the, COVID, they are, the COVID cases were very high in the cities, in the area with the higher population density, and because they have the high population density, and especially in the south of Vietnam, they did not implement the lockdown policy very well. So that's why in the south of Vietnam, there are more COVID cases, there are more people affected, and a lot of people die in that time when they don't have the vaccine. So in that time, the healthcare system, although in the city it's better, in the poor area, but because of higher population density and higher uh, COVID cases, so they are more affected. So I think uh, that also for the COVID, um, it's uh, not only problem of the social protection, but also as a policy like uh, the lockdown policy, they are also important. Uh, in Vietnam, in the north, in, in the city like uh, Hanoi city, they also have the higher population density, but the lockdown policy it, uh, seemed better than in the, in the south. So the number of COVID cases is smaller in, 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 in Hanoi. So I think the social protection is important, here also important, but uh, maybe especially for the pandemic like uh, COVID, the lockdown is also the most important in case when the people, they don't have the vaccine. Yeah, so that's... Uh, Important. 
Uh, thank you again to the presenters. And now we give the opportunity again to the audience for any further questions. So I, I should partly know this myself, but I'll blame it from having been away from the job for a little bit. Um, there's been always a lot of talk of what can we learn from COVID. Is there at least some learnings we can take from a really bad crisis, also in terms of policy? Um, David, you halfway has already said everything was kind of just dismantled again from the emergency measures. Um, but I'm wondering now over time and the countries that you work with or that you've also been visiting and done trainings in, um, I mean, it clearly must have... The, the debate on social protection was on during COVID. And I'm wondering uh, in your research, but also in your exchange with countries, have you seen any changes, maybe not forcingly yet in policy, but in the way how people look at social protection and the way how it should be run. Um, I'm, not, I, I'm not asking for a silver bullet for proxy means testing versus income testing, but just how you feel the debate might have shifted or changed now that we are more or less out of COVID. Then go, go ahead. Okay, so in, in, in my country, I think that... Uh, after the pandemic, uh, well, d during the pandemic, there were difficulties to reach the the, the poor in need. Uh, so, one uh, difficulty was, uh, for instance, that the the people that needed the the cash transfer uh, didn't have at the moment a bank account or access to uh, the financial system. So, uh, the government implemented some uh, digital alternatives to make the transfer and. After the pandemic, uh, they realized that th this was very important. So, for instance, uh, the government now is trying to deploy a social registry, uh, trying to capture uh, more easily the information for uh, the people not receiving uh, the transfers because they have a robust system for those receiving the typical transfers, for instance, conditional cash transfers. The, this is a very good database. But for during the pandemic, uh, well, there were... Uh, some beneficiaries that were not, uh, some potential beneficiaries uh, due to, to the pandemic that they were not receiving anything. So the government went uh, door to door looking for, for them. So I think that's the change, but not a change in the, um, in, the, in the tax system, but in the way that we have information for all the potential beneficiaries. That's the, the main change that I see. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for the presenters. Congratulations for a good presentation. My name is Yosef Atmam from Tanzania Revenue Authority. So um, I'm just adding up on issue of social protection. Uh, I think it should go case by case. Uh, for example, in Tanzania, the social protection went to, to exemption to, to the companies which were producing this mask. So to the, the government provided mask to, to, to some people to protect them. So even though we didn't have the lockdown, but the issue of social protection was considered because the exemption was provided to some uh, importers who were importing this uh, mask for the people. And even the companies which were producing uh, the sanitary, so those, the, as what we, we apply to the hands. So. So uh, that's what was provided by the, the government and the, the exemption was uh, granted to those uh, companies which were producing it. So uh, if we say the protection was provided by the government, so thank you so much. I just want to add that. Th thank you for the comment. And perhaps to, to come back to, to the comment and to uh, Vanda's questions, I guess all the presentations were taken as take about what happened but perhaps the main, the second aim of, of, of the presentation was what do we learn and where do we go from here? So I'd like just to give perhaps two to three minutes to each presenter to uh, let us know so then what or how should social protection look like if we were thinking about uh, systems that would protect better vulnerable, vulnerable populations and also what are the financing options? Uh, clearly, Vanda referred to that. So. If you were to propose something uh, to do an exact evaluation of what uh, social systems should look like for, uh, in order to cushion uh, 
uh, income shocks from future crises, what would you be suggesting? Well, I think, um, I think for us it's important to, to first of all show that there are now uh, tools in place that help you to carry out ex ante evaluation. So in our case, we are not focusing on COVID per se, but we are uh, providing more general results. And we are using tax benefit micro simulation models that are openly accessible. So we are hoping that by also showing these results, we can start a conversation in different countries about how can we use the limited budget in, to improve the social protection system and how can we not only prepare the population for um, life cycle shocks or uh, more general shocks, but also how can we improve the design of our system uh, to provide uh, insurance in times of crisis. So I think uh, maybe uh, a message that we would like to push is that uh, ex ante evaluation is important. We are aware that the fiscal space is really small and by using tools such as tax benefit micro simulation but also other tools, governments now have the possibility to, to test uh, and to understand the design of their system better and to test how they can use the fiscal space. Um, and of course, yeah, increasing the fiscal space is also important and uh, how, how can we improve not only the coverage of benefits but also the amount of benefits is important. So we need more fiscal space and I'm sure there are various options uh, where we can, um, yeah, I guess that's also the theme of this conference, right? How to increase revenues and of course one important agenda is also to bring more people into formal employment and so that they contribute to a larger tax base and to more revenues. Uh, there are various tax exam exemptions that we've already learned about this morning that could be thought about. Um, I guess uh, in many cases increasing the revenues is not only looking at households but really looking at companies and, and other actors in the economy. Mm, but yeah, for, for me, one important message is really to use uh, the tools that are out there to carry out ex ante evaluation of social protection systems, to start thinking ab about the design of measures and to, to understand better how the system works and where we have maybe coverage gaps and where the, the system is not sufficient. Well, one thing that I uh, pick from my, my presentation and Catherine's is this uh, role of automatic stabilizers. Uh, I think uh, as we saw that automatic stabilizers are not uh, important in, in the context of, uh, of crisis. So, and for instance, uh, in, in Latin American countries, they increase a lot um, um, they had to increase uh, suddenly a, a lot uh, government expenditure, but if you have automatic stabilizers and these are uh, well designed, uh, you don't have to do that in times of crisis. So I think we have the models and we can uh, think, for instance, on some kind of unemployment benefit that is not uh, currently in, in, in some countries in Latin America, maybe that they automatically cushion the, the effect of crisis. So I think that is uh, one message important from, from our research and we can model this with the, the tax benefit micro simulations for Latin America or for Africa to see uh, how, to, how to cushion this, this kind of uh, events. Thank you. Um, so from um, experience from Vietnam, so I think, uh, um, so that time the Vietnam failed to impose a lockdown in, in the south of Vietnam. So that caused many people die that time. And one reason is that the, um, because uh, the government, they have the limited resources. So they try to identify the people, the most affected people and provide the, the, the support for them. But it takes very long time to identify the, the, the correct one. So I think um, a better lesson may be during the pandemic, so the government, they should provide the full coverage 
the full coverage, the, 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 the support for, for all the people. So, and once all the people, they can receive the support timely, and then the government, they can able to impose the lockdown. Because if they impose a longer time of lockdown and the people, they don't have the job, they don't have the support, so they cannot, they cannot follow the lockdown. So I think one lesson maybe during the crisis like um, COVID-19, and if the government wants to impose the lockdown for a long time, they have to provide the social assistance for all the people. They don't need, uh, they, they shouldn't care much about the leakage. They don't, don't need to care about the how to identify most uh, affected people. They should provide the full coverage. Of course, that, that cost a lot of money, but, but, but we need to do that. We should do that. Yeah, that uh, I think. Yeah. Thank you, and I think all, all points are very, very interesting. Coming to the last point, that's something that happened, for example, in Brazil. In Brazil, this is the only country in Latin America where during the pandemic 2020, inequality dropped because these uh, aid packages were given almost uh, universally. There was a big uh, expenditure from the government, and actually what we see now is the reversal. So in 2021 now, uh, inequality has increased, so it perhaps goes, goes in that direction. As, as you said, perhaps it's, it's not only thinking about uh, generosity and charity, it's thinking about the duration, so how timely this the, the government can react to in, in times of crisis. Um, if there's any last uh, comment from the audience. Okay, thank you very much for your good presentation. My name is Issa from Zanzibar. I want to address my question to last presenter about the estimation techniques. We know when we want to propose a policy implication, we needed to rely on the finding of, of, of the result. But I'm not sure whether the, the estimation technique the last presenter used was robust or not. So I just want to know the justification of selecting fixed, uh, fixed regression model instead of random regression model. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So actually, in the um, um, I use a panel data, something like a panel data, and with the three uh, year in the baseline in the 2019, no one affected. So there no lockdown, no catch transfer support for COVID, and then in the 2020 and 2021, the lockdown time and the eight package level they vary across the individual and vary across the, the provinces. So that's why we can identify the impacts. Uh, for other characteristic variable, maybe uh, you can take a, uh, 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 my report, so it's a more fully uh, description of the, of the method. Yeah. But I think it's a quite simple and uh, straightforward uh, regression. Yeah. Great, so not only can you uh, take a look to the report, you can also catch up with any of the presenters during the coffee break, so please free, feel free to interrupt them and, uh, if, if you have the opportunity. So thank you very much to everyone, especially to our presenters, to people who have asked questions in the audience, and I hope you enjoy the coffee break and the rest of the conference. <laughs>